do at, uh, at these Bible studies, I try to introduce uh, new people who have, uh, who is doing something that all of us need to know about and that has the possibility of impacting our nation. And I'm sort of waiting on a brother. He might show up, but I'm going to save five minutes for him at the end of my uh, at the end of my uh, program because I want you folks to hear uh, from him. And I don't see him here in my. Uh, he's from Houston. I don't even remember his name, but uh, uh, I saw, but I will know him if I see him. Uh, but when he appear in this building, if he appear, uh, uh, he's a short guy. Uh, 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 he looks sort of like somewhere a twitch between a Hispanic and a, an Italian. And so uh, if he get in this building, he's very short. He's going to come up front probably. So you guys uh, let him know that he's going to be on this program here. I'm going to save five minutes for, uh, 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 for him. So open your Bibles this morning to the um, the little epistle of John. Uh, there's a lot of verses in the scripture that that sort of become guiding principles in my own life. Uh, one of the guiding principles in my life have been uh, Acts 1:8. When I was discipled after my conversion in 1957, an old Presbyterian theologian discipled me, and he taught me the Word of God. He anchored me in some of the major biblical principles. You know, he sort of installed into my life a sort of a, a sort of a philosophy of life in terms of how do you read the Bible and apply the Bible to your own life first, but the whole idea is to try to apply it to society. And Acts 1-8 has become my guiding principle in my life. When Jesus said, these are the last words of Jesus where he said, but you shall receive power. Uh, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. And then with the Holy Spirit, then, you shall be witnesses unto me. He helped me to understand that the Spirit of God comes to live in us in order that we might be effective witness for Jesus Christ. That we might have the courage of our conviction. That we might be able to testimony to the fact of, 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 of God's life. That it would make Jesus Christ real in our life. He would lead us and guide us into our truth. And so the first work of the Holy Spirit was to help us be prepared and equipped to give us the courage and the power that we might be his witness. It wasn't to be our toy. Uh, it wasn't even to be to let other people know that we are Christian. That was not what he gave the Holy Spirit for. He want our love to do that. He want our love to be the one that people can see out there. But he wants the Holy Spirit to come into us and to lead us and to guide us, to help us with understanding the Word of God, making Jesus Christ real to us in life. And so he discipled me in that. And so I got a good understanding of the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And so when the, when, 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 the, when the Spirit came back to the church, I didn't have to cut monkey shine and be a booger man and be confused about the Holy Spirit. I knew what the Holy Spirit was supposed to do. I knew that just speaking in tongues was not the end of what the Holy Spirit was supposed to do. It was not really the evidence of the Holy Spirit, and I like to hear people speak in tongues and all of that. So I'm not speaking against that. But that wasn't the primary work of the Holy Spirit. It was to lead him to guide us in all truth and give us the courage of our conviction so that we could be created witness for him in the world. And then he helped me to understand the gospel, what it was. This old man helped me to understand that. The gospel is God's power. The, the, God's power is locked up in his gospel. It is demonstrated in his gospel. The gospel, if we talk about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's in the resurrection that we absolutely see the power of God. Uh, the power that was able to bring Jesus Christ again from the dead. 
That's, and not only that, but the power that was able to rocket him all the way to God's right hand. We see the demonstration of God's power there. And so the, the, the resurrection, that's, that's a part of the gospel. That's a part of the gospel. Uh, but the gospel is the love of God demonstrated. It is more than just a proclamation. And when I hear most of my evangelical theologians talk about it, they talk about the world will be better when the gospel is heard all around the world. I don't necessarily believe that. I believe when the gospel is demonstrated that we got to do the gospel not just in words and in tongues, but we got to do it in deeds and in truth. The gospel, Jesus demonstrated his love at the cross. The Bible says God demonstrated his love toward us. He didn't just tell us how much he loved us. He demonstrated that love. And so you and I have the responsibility to demonstrate that love. That we have to do it in words and in deeds. It's more than just talking about it. But it's living it out in reality. And that's what we here at CCDA wants to do. We want to bring that dominion of faith and works to society. And it takes both of those put together. Because if faith don't produce good works, that faith is dead. And so it's the good works we can see that authenticates our faith. James says, show me your faith by your works. And so this old man helped me to understand that but the gospel, the gospel lived out is the power of God unto salvation. So he helped me, but he also helped me to understand that the church was the steward of that gospel. That, 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 that the truth of God that's displayed in the gospel was delivered to the saints. And it was not delivered to just an individual. If it would, it, we would have all these cults in the world. But the gospel was delivered to a collective group of people. Jesus took 12 disciples, and from that the 12 apostles come, and the truth was delivered to them. And now it's left up to us to carry on and to content for the truth that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And so we as a collective body of believers, and I'm talking about really at a local level, at a local level. When I talk of the church, I'm talking more or less about the local church, about the congregation that meets, about the church in the community that can be powerful. So we can evaluate it and know. Uh, I believe that the weakness today that we have got set on the fact that numbers is going to change the world. And so we got this massive homogeneous church growth that eliminates reconciliation. It, it eliminates the very fact that Jew and Gentile, black and white, is supposed to be in that one body together. That would be the greatest miracle in the world if we can see churches. That is a miracle when I come to churches and see black, white, Jew and Gentile worshiping God together. When the church reflects the community in which it is located, that is what the church is supposed to be because the church is supposed to be both a family and a community, a body of people there. And so the church really is God's witness in the world. You got, we got to come back to that. Uh, the gates of hell can prevail against you as an individual. But the gates of hell cannot prevail against God's collective body of believers. And so we can be effective. And so this old man helped me to understand that. And then he helped me to understand, even before I had heard the word out in society, what was indigenous leadership development. And he used... Second Timothy 2.2, 2. you help me. Paul says to Timothy, that which you have heard of me among many witnesses, that commit unto faithful men and women who shall be able to teach others also. And, and so we was to go out. And if you follow Paul's life, he went into those heathen lands and he established indigenous churches. And then, of course, why he used Timothy and Silas and all those other people to help supervise those churches, he believed that those people could manage themselves. That's what makes CCDA unique. We believe in the inherited dignity of the people with the problem. We believe that if you give, you help people to come to know Jesus Christ, help them to get the skills and the discipleship, those people can solve their own problems. 
So I don't go out and go trying to fix people's problems for them. When we do that, we make people over-dependent. But we guarantee our social programs are going to last. Because we're going to gather people together and keep them as our clients. Well, what we need to be doing is empowering people to take responsibility for their own lives and their own family. And that's what CC Day is all, is all about. And so, so this old man helped me to understand that. But he also helped me to understand the importance of the Word of God. That not only do we just read the Word of God, not only the plot, but we read the Word of God in order that it might uh, discipline and purge our own soul. The Word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. The Word of God is the food that the Spirit needs to strive upon day by day. And so it's not enough to just read the Word of God once a week like you would eat once a week. But it's important that you read the Word of God daily. Daily. And if one part of the Word gets dull to you, then go over there and read something that brings you life. Sometimes in my study, as I read, the Word gets dull. Then I go to the Psalms. And I just read the Psalms. I read that to bring me the kind of a, a joy that I need. In all, and so I need that Word of God in my life. As a song I like to say, is all of my steps by your word. And the reason I have these Bible classes here, I'm just having them because I cannot really teach very much to you. But what I have these Bible classes in the center of CCDA in order to let you know the importance of the word of God in our lives. And to and teach the people to get into this word. And so this morning, what we want to do then is continue our study here from the... from. Um, the little epistle of, uh, of, of John. What I want to do this morning is to go back again to verse 3 of chapter 2. And we're going to sit in there. And, and if I had a theme this morning, it would be uh, walk in your talk. How do we walk our talk? How, how do we live out our talk? How do we bring our walk in line with our talk? I hear a lot of this Christian stuff today. You got a Christian life. People can give you, you can ask people to do almost anything, and they will get into this whole idea of this giftedness. And we need these gifts, and God wants all of us to have a gift, but they will say things, that's not my gift. And since it's not my gift, it releases me from being responsible. That's yours. A gift. And so we want you today to, uh, we want to talk about today how do we apply the Word of God to our lives. How do we know that we are uh, a Christian? So let's look at verse, verse um, uh, 3 here. And we want to look then at the, at the true test of Christianity. The true, the true test of Christianity here is works motivated by love. Okay, works motivated by love. That is our uh, Christian test. True religion and under fire before God the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep oneself unspotted before the world. And so we also have got to think about how do we live a holy life. And that's what God wants to do in our life. We can't live as we please. We are not our own. We are bought with a prize, and we are responsible for the way we live, and the Holy Spirit comes to help us to live out that life, and so that we can produce some righteousness to our own life here on earth. And so let's go to our, let's go to our test this morning. Verse 3 says, how do we know that we are Christian? And hereby know we that we know him. This is the way we know that we know him. And the way we know him is by keeping his commandment. Now there, there's a little controversy here when we talk about keeping his commandment because there, there is an Old Testament commandment and there is a New Testament commandment. But Jesus took the Old Testament commandment and the New Testament commandment and put it all into one. And he said the Old Testament commandment was to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then to love your neighbor, you love yourself. He put those two together and he said that is what the commandment was all about. The commandment then was to produce love. And the kind of love that the Old Testament commandment demanded of us, we could not do it. It 
man is a righteousness only God himself could produce. And so God himself then came and produced the righteousness that he required in Jesus Christ. He that knew no sin then was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so the Old Testament law demanded a righteousness that we could not do. It let us remind us that we were sinful. It reminded us that we needed a Savior. And that Jesus Christ came and he fulfilled the law. Born under the law. He fulfilled the law. And now he redeems us from the death, the curse of the law. Now, now we can fulfill that law in him. He has to be a part of us in order for us to do it. And so the Old Testament, the other commandment, was the same. It was the idea that he, God wanted to see righteousness. A righteousness that sinful mankind could not produce. So God himself came and produced that righteousness, then gave his life. Now, when we come to know him as Lord and Savior, he then closes us in his righteousness. And he accounts Jesus' life for our life. He counts Jesus' death for our death. And now, through the Holy Spirit in us now, we can produce the righteousness that God requires of us here on earth. We still can't produce it by ourselves. We still need the Spirit of God. And we're going to see not only we need, to, in order for that to be nurtured to do that, we need to be in fellowship with God, and we need to be in fellowship with each other. Now, we talked about that already, and that's absolutely important, that you cannot live the kind of Christian life to produce the kind of righteousness that God wants you and I to produce, the kind of witness. We cannot do that in isolation. We need other brothers and sisters. So the idea then is that we got to be in fellowship with God. We're in fellowship with each other. Sin comes in. We watch that. And sin breaks our fellowship with God. And it will break our fellowship with each other. I can tell in our congregation, we have a wonderful congregation in Jackson. And I can tell in our congregation when the people that we know, we know each other so well. And I can tell when our people uh, get into sin. They stop having fellowship. They stop having fellowship. And you and I fellowship, some of us try to go after those people. Because sin not only breaks the fellowship with God, but it breaks the fellowship with the other saints. And then you lose your effectiveness. And for us then, we lost a gift that could be utilized in the body. That's the whole idea. That the church cannot be effective as it could be if our brothers within the congregation are living in sin. So it becomes our responsibility as the people of God, if we hear that our brother have sinned, do we to go get that brother and nurture that brother and bring that brother back into the fellowship. We bring him back so that we all can be effective. You can't be effective if the gifts are not being displayed within that community. And so the brother who's walking in sin, you see, if that gift is being neglected, it is not being brought to bear within the community, then it becomes our responsibility to go there and to bring that brother or that sister back into the body. How may we know? Let's go back to our teaching here. And how may we know that we know him and we keep his commandment? And he that says, listen to what he says in verse 4. He that says, I know him, and that's the thing that we're talking about today, and that we need to know that we know Christ. I remember when I was first converted, I was converted in a, in a, in a little holiness church. And in this little holiness church, a wonderful holiness church, uh, but these people had accepted this, the idea that, that when you sin, you lost your salvation. And, and, and whenever you sin, you were lost. And man, I was pent up. Because I knew that in me, while I was confessing it, I just did not feel confidence that I could live the Christian life alone. And then this old same Presbyterian elder who discipled me. And I went to him and I told him the motion I was having. And I was telling him how, how I was having. Because I was trying to stop smoking cigars. I was stop trying to do all those things. I was trying to stop going to the racetrack. And, you know, I, and I kept feeling myself wanting to go there. So even though I was very safe, 
You, you understand? I'm going through these struggles. And so I'm wondering whether or not I'm really saved or not. I really want to be saved, but I got these struggles in me, in society. And he opened the book, the Bible to me, to the Gospel of John, and he read it to me. And he just like it printed on my mind. It says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which give them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He said to me, John, are you in your Father's hand? Uh, did, did God embrace you? Are you in his hand? Do you think you can get out of his hand? Then he went to that verse over there in Romans. Where it says, neither death nor life, neither principality, no other creature can be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's when I got stable. I began to get stable. Now I can begin to proclaim and witness the word of God with some confidence that I was in the hands of God, that I belong to God. You need to know that you are saved. You need to be living with the certainty that you know Jesus Christ so you can be effective. You don't need that doubt in your life. Sin is going to bring the doubt. Sin will bring the doubt because sin is going to separate that precious relationship you have with God. And then it's going to bring the question under your life. But he's already told us how we can restore that relationship by confessing it. We need the blood of Jesus Christ in our lives all the time. I am glad for that old hymn I quoted yesterday. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein and I, John Perkins, have to go beneath that flood from day to day to lose all of my guilt and all of my stain. And so I don't live with my guilt. I don't live with my sin. I confess my sins to Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's go. So you got to know. You got to know that you belong to God. Look what he says now in verse 5. Whosoever keepeth his word. Look what it said. Verse 4 said, He that says I know him and keep not his commandment is a lie. If, 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 if you are not living out, attempting to live out uh, the will of God, and that's important I said the will of God, because the will of God is everything. That we're, if you're not attempting to live out the, the will of God, then that might be that you might not have really accepted in a personal way where you have really received the kind of repentance that you needed to in order to really genuinely be saved in society. Look what he says. He says it here. Look what he says that. He that says I know him and keep not his commandment. You can't live as you please. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. It's a lie. And he said, and the truth is not in him. But look what he says in verse 5. But whosoever keepeth his word. Now this is important. Whosoever keepeth his word. Keeping his word is living in obedience to him and attempting to carry out his will. That's living in obedience to his word. That's trying to obey his word. Truth. And one of the things that's thrilling me, and it's catching on here, because I started in this Bible class talking about this massive prison system that is destroying our community. And there's not many people uh, in, in a family of any size that don't have somebody in this prison system. I got a son that is messed up in this prison system in our society. And it's destructive destructive, it's corrupt, it's wasteful in our society. And if the church missed that in terms of seeing the burden of it, but it also might miss it in terms of hearing what Jesus said and what Wayne said last night. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to open the doors of the prison. Open the doors of the prison. 
And so we, that's where we gotta go. That's where we gotta go. We gotta surround these jails and we gotta surround these prisons. And I would like to see next year that people come here by the hundred and say, we have developed these dirts and houses for these women, men and women who have come out of prison. We gotta do that. And we, it's to our advantage. The great leaders of the world comes out of prison. What make Mandela such a powerful guy is he came out of prison. The Apostle Paul, such a powerful guy, he got uh, John Bunyan, John Bunyan, Pilgrim Progress, sold more books than anything outside of the Bible. Why? Why? He was in the prison cells that he was able to think creatively. Think creatively. We need to be rescuing these people from the prison, not just for their sake, but for our sake. So they can bring back to us the kind of courage and determination that we need in order to be effective. So we need them. We need them in, in our society. And so we got to reach out after them. Now look what he says here. We got to keep the word. We got to walk out keeping the word. We got to do the word. You, you, you know, he that hears my word. And you, it's not only them that hear it, but he that believes and he that keeps the word. Verse Let's continue here. Uh, that we know we in him. Uh, but whosoever keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God made perfect. As we attempt to keep the word of God, as we attempt then to live by the word of God, the word of God then helps us with that joy. Because the word of God becomes sweet. It becomes precious to us. You remember those guys on the Emmaus Road? They said, didn't our hearts burn as he meditated and taught us the word? So the word of God should be that which gives us the energy and the enthusiasm to be obedient to him in life. Verse 6 says, he that says, look what he says now, he that says, I abide in him. Now, you know, if you notice the Bible carefully, being a Christian is staying in Christ and in a relationship to Christ. We need to be conscious of that. And that's why we need to then keep our sins confessed so we can stay in that relationship, so we can abide in him uh, day by day. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk as he walked. You see, so when we're walking with Christ, then we are trying, we are producing, God is producing in us the righteousness that he produced. God is reproducing that own righteousness in our own life as we walk here on earth. Verse 7 says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment, it is the word which you have heard from the beginning. And then he turned around and said, Now a new commandment I give un right unto you, which is true in him. And it's also true in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shines. Look what happens, really, when you come to know Jesus Christ. This is what happens to you. The Apostle Paul's life is a good illustration of what happens to a person when they come to know Jesus Christ. What happened to the Apostle Paul on that Damascus road was this. The light of God's love shine into his heart and you hear that voice said Paul saw saw why are you persecuting me why you don't love me and he cried out and said who are thou Lord and he said I'm Jesus Christ whom you are persecute what happened on that road God shine his light of love that's what repentance is Repentance is when God shines his light of love into your life. And when that light of love comes into your life, you see your sins. And you see your sins as sinful. In fact, I mean, it would be paralyzing if God shines his light into your heart. And if you didn't see that light as being God's love for you, you would commit suicide. You'd be hopeless. When you see that light, when you look at yourself, you'll know that God is coming for you. That God loves you. 
And the God, I can remember that Sunday morning and that little Lord holding this church in Pasadena when God shined his light of love into this economic animal's life. Y'all don't know I'm an economic animal. I, I love business deals. You know, and so I was an economic animal. And I was basically concerned about myself and my family, and that was about as far as it went. And that morning, God shined his light of love into my heart. And he showed me the depths of my sin. And that my sin was not just against my wife. It wasn't just against society. But my sin was against this holy light that loved me. My sin was against God that morning. And that morning, I started weeping. And, and you know, that morning it was in me, it was both, that weeping was both joy and sadness at the same time. And I remember those in the, in the black community when you start weeping, especially an old man, a guy like me, a young guy, 27 years old, and I'm sitting there weeping in the church. And of course, those ladies, the guys can start fanning me. I wasn't hot. I wasn't hot. And they come over there fanning me, fanning me, and fanning me. I didn't need no fanning. Uh, what God was doing there, he was showing me the depths of my sin. And then I asked God to forgive me. And I, it was an instant. Now, I felt that morning, I felt something had happened. I felt that I was absolutely free of the sin for that day. But then as I went back, I began to think of all the things I had done. How I cheated on Vera May. All of the stuff that I had done. And how I had done all of these things. And God began to purge me of those things in my life. And I began to confess them before the Lord. And then I came to this place that I felt that God had forgiven me. Forgiven me of my sin. You see, and so God shows us our sin as sinful. I feel sorry for these. I know you can be culturally Christianity, and I know some of y'all grew up without doing any great sins. I understand that. Well, but when God shine His light of love into you, I mean, you see those little old bitty things. You remember stealing those watermelon. You remember all of those kind of things. You know, as as as, as a boy, and you see it as sinful. You see it as something you shouldn't have done. In line. Okay, let's, let me go here. Uh, they're going to get me if I don't keep going here. Uh, uh, let's go to verse, uh, verse, uh, verse, uh, what we at? Verse 6? No, verse 7. Uh, let's go to verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past. That was, that's when that light shined into your life, the darkness is past, and now the true light now shines. That's the light that lighteth every person that comes into the world. You, you, you understand? And Jesus has already said, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that's what he's talking about now. We have the light of life. Verse 9 says, he that says he's in the light and hates his brother. Now we're coming to the acid test. You can't be a Christian and a bigot. It's a conflict. It's a conflict. We are losing too much time talking about reconciliation. We ought to be talking more about people getting genuinely saved. See, white folks have put this religion together in a way that you can be Christian and bigot. And so we have accepted a piece of what it means to be Christian. Uh, you, you understand in our life. It's a conflict. It's a conflict. It's a conflict. Look what he said. He said it here. Listen up. I'm not going to do much on this. He said, he that says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness. Look, boy, I am for the nation of Israel. I want you to know that. I'm also for the Palestine people. I want you to know that the Jewish people in Israel is in the dark. In the dark. They're in the dark because those Palestine people are confronting them with rocks and stones and they are shooting them down like flies. They are in the dark because they are brothers. They are Abraham's 
children. They hate their brothers. Now, those wonderful Palestine should really know better than throw those rocks against those machine guns. <laughs> and so I want you to know that the Palestine people are in the dark too. And that is not the way you bring about God's spiritual change. The way Jesus brought about our redemption is that he laid down his life for us. The reason the people of India got their redemption from India is because Gandhi was willing to lay down his life. He didn't throw rocks. He laid down his life. And the reason I'm able to stand here and preach to you today and to preach to all of you here together, my brothers and sisters from Mississippi, white and black, and all of us together, and we're together like that in Mississippi, it's not because I'm so good, it's because people like Martin Luther King, instead of throwing rocks, went out and laid down their life. And if we are going to redeem, if we're going to redeem our people today, and we're going to see reconciliation take place, we as God's people, has got to move away from this superficial prosperity God bless me seed Christianity Amen. all of that is nothing but an extension of greediness Amen. we're going to have to be willing to go down and lay down our lives for those people that we really want to see come to Christ we're going to see that if he was willing to lay down his life for you and me we ought to be willing to lay down our lives for our sisters and brothers out there in society and I want you to know that that's the way peace is going to come we're not ready today because as I said we we think we can have it all I mean we think that we can be both rich and prosperous and give God a little over excess of a discretionary money and that's about what Christianity is doing I don't know many Christians that are looking and saying, how, what can I do? How much can I give to Jesus Christ? Well, I want you to know there's a few that's doing that. There's one young businessman that I hear this week, and he got quite a bit of wealth. And boy, he's looking for creative ways that he can use his wealth. Not, not to give it away. He can, he has been able to see what the charitable stuff is doing to us. It makes us too dependent. It makes us too greedy. But he want to talk about how he can utilize his resources to invest, to develop businesses in the urban community. Next year, he's going to put on a workshop and a seminar. And he's developing these businesses now. He done developed four of them. And they are very successful. And he want to see them develop. And he want to see them spread it throughout the CCDA. And he want the CCDA uh, ministry to be the place where they are demonstrated in their, in our society. And so he's demonstrating uh, his love. Okay, let's continue here in, in this passage. Where are we at now? Uh, verse, verse 10. He that love, uh, he that, well, okay, if you, if, if you hate your brother, you're in darkness even unto now. That's what we're saying. And, and over there in Palestine, they're in darkness. The Jews are in darkness. And the Arabs are in darkness even until now. But he that, look what he says, verse 10. He that loveth his brother abides in light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. The word of God and the righteousness that God produces is shining into his heart. And the word and the light has become a lamp unto his feet and a light unto his pathway. He is walking his talk. But he that hates his brother, verse 11, is in the darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he goes because darkness has blinded his eyes. And I want you to know that if you are not a reconciler, if your faith will not let you, and we have to do this as black folk, we got to get over it. We got to get over it. We got to get over what happened to us and my grandparents some time ago. We got to get over that. We got to be able to forgive. Be able to forgive. And white folks have got to be able to forgive. And black folks have got to be able to give. And Chinese and Spanish and all of us got to be able to forgive each other. In life. 
Well, let me finish here. Let me finish. Darkness has blind eyes. And he says here, and now this is the verse I want to get to, so I'm going I'm to skip down from verse 12, and I'm going to skip down to verse uh, 15, and this is where I want to close at here uh, this morning. Uh, have anybody seen my man come in yet? Uh, the guy from, is there a guy here from uh, Houston, Texas? My buddy from Houston, Texas? Uh, come on up here. Now you're going to have to pull off your shoes. Come on up here. I want you to make your way up here. I want you to say something at the end here. Uh, but you, when you get here near, you're going to pull off your shoes. Uh, okay. okay let, let me finish here. Let me finish here. Here. Let's skip down to verse 15, and I want to close here. The acid test, what I'm saying here, of the Christian life here, is our fellowship with God, our fellowship with each other, and our uh, obedience that produces love. That is the acid test of the Christian faith. That's what we are getting at here in our in our conversation here this morning. And then he skips down to verse 15. And this is what, how this love is to be directed. We're to, we're to direct this love towards God. We're to direct this love towards our brothers and sisters. And then we're to direct this love towards the most needed in society. That's the way the love is supposed to be. First, that love is to be demonstrated in our home, in our family. Then it's to be demonstrated with each other within the body. And then we're to demonstrate that love then by focusing that love in the most needy. Uh, Jesus, now somebody's going to say, what about the rich? What about the rich? People always say that to me. You, we're to focus our main attention of our love toward the poor. People say to me all the time, they say, uh, you always talking about the poor. What about the rich? Uh, I say, uh, I have to look for the poor, but the rich can find me because they all got cell phones. <laughs> and, 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 and so the, the rich will find you. You know, what we have to do is go out and look. And don't worry about the rich. Don't worry about the rich. They'll find you. They will not only find you, but they will buy you when they find you. So don't worry about the rich. The rich will find you. Let's focus our attention, you see, on the poor in our society. And if you focus your attention on the poor in society, then I'll tell you what will happen. The rich will find you. I mean, my phone rings all the time with the rich. I mean, the rich want to tell me what to do all the time. And, and the rich got a program for me. If I do what they want, I mean, uh, because they want significant. They got their money, but they haven't found significant. And to them, significant is owning a racehorse. To them, significant is owning a baseball team. To them, significant is owning a church where they make all decisions. <laughs> I mean, the rich wants to show significant with their power. So let's put our attention on winning the poor. Let's go to our mind close here this morning. What he says here, this is the way I love where our love is to be focused. You see where our love is to be focused. Now I want to show you in closing where our love should not be focused. And that's where these prosperity preachers are trying to tell me. They're trying to tell me that the love should be focused on my range, on my necklace, on my clothes, on my Mercedes, on my bigness. They're telling me that that's where my focus needs to be. They are telling me that if they are prosperous, then the society will be prosperous in society. Let's look then where our focus need to be, where our focus need not be. He, verse 15 says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any person love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because he says this, all that is in the world comes from the desire to get power. They, we're going to see here, when Jesus came into the world, the great temptation was this. Satan wanted Jesus' power. And Satan approached Jesus and said, if you be the son of God, Turn these bread, 
this stone into bread. If you, be the son of God, jump down from this, display your power. I want that power. If you be the son of God. And so all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And I'm going to close with this because I want to give my brother uh, a few minutes here. Some brother I've just met, I, I want to share with him. I want this whole body to feel some of the passion that he feels. I'm going to give him five minutes now. I'm going to let y'all hear that so that y'all won't be embarrassed when I stop him uh, like it was the other night. We couldn't stop the brother last night, other night, and I thought Noel did such a lovely job, and I knew the first thing in the morning somebody was going to come to me telling me, why didn't y'all stop the brother? Well, we didn't have no idea when he was going to stop. And he was so loving, and he did so good music, and it was really a pressure on us to have to stop him. So I don't want to do that to my brother this morning. So I'm letting you know that already. I'm giving him a good five minutes to give the, to give the, uh, to give the display here this morning. But he says here, all that is in the world, I'm closing with this. I go around all the time and meet with our CCDA people. That's what I give my life to. The division and the turmoils that I find, listen to this carefully, the conflicts, the division, and even as I talk to you here and begin to talk to you about developing your program, uh, what, is doing, what is happening to us, we are organizing too much pride into our program. Most of the division, when I come down to conflicts, every time I come down to it, it's an ego problem. It's an ego pride, and, and pride is something, it's difficult for you to get your hands on. It's sneaky. Sneaky. So when the Satan come after you, he come after you first with the lust of the flesh. Get all these things. Or get all these pretty women. And do all this kind of stuff. That's the first way he comes out of it. Uh, the next thing he comes out of it with is a lust of the eye. You need this. You need this. And if that don't get you, he got his ace in the hole. And his ace in the hole is the pride of life. And that's the one that gets us. And it's almost have created a situation where we can't have conversation with each other. And that's what I love about CCDA and CCDA's board, is that we can have conversation with each other. And if you be a part of my ministry and even know that, I come into the office and I say, we have conversation. We talk about the issues of life. I, I say, Eva, let's get through it. Let's get through it. Let's get through that. We need this kind of relationship with each other. We can do that because she loves me so dearly. And I love her so dearly. And because of that, we, Pat, you and I used to do the same thing. Let's get over it. Let's get through this stuff. And let's talk about the issue of life. We need to develop relationship. We need to put our pride aside and develop these kinds. Let's get a cause in our life. Let's live for something. And that cause ought to be for rescuing the perishing, caring for the dying, snatching them in pity from sin in the grave.